Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Diana Warren. I'm the director of the Department of the Interior Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our latest installment of our lunchtime lecture series. And as many of you know, these presentations tend to encompass a wide range of topics uh, that reflect the diverse workings of um, both our bureaus and the Department of the Interior as a whole, uh, both past and present. Today's program is a discussion on planting gardens with pollinators in mind and the resources available through the Fish and Wildlife Service and its partners to help you do just that. Before we get started, I wanted to point out that on your seats is a feedback form and we encourage you to fill out and deposit these outside the, um, the doors there at the conclusion of the lecture. Uh, in terms of programming coming up on Wednesday, August 17th, uh, Dr. Alan O'Connell from the U.S. Geological Survey Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, um, he's going to be coming and speaking on the Whooping Crane be Breeding Program, which came to a conclusion this year after over 50 years of um, conservation science. Uh, on Wednesday, September 4th, Dr. Rodney, Rodney uh, Cluck, Chief of the Division of Environmental Sciences at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, will be discussing emergent uh, technologies and the future of ocean science. But turning our attention to today's presenter, uh, Dr. Dolores Savignano chairs the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Pollinator Work Group, which works to raise awareness of and support of the value, conservation, protection, and enhancement of native pollinators and also their habitats. Uh, she also is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service liaison to the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a wide range of pollinator projects throughout the country and internationally. Uh, Dr. Savignano received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Yale University and a Ph.D. in Zoology from the University of Texas at Austin for her research on the um, faculative mutualism uh, between the Carner Blue Fly larva and attendant bees. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dolores Savignano. Thank you, Diana, and thanks to all of you for coming today. Can everybody hear me okay? Alrighty, great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. As Diana said, I'm going to talk about bringing your yard live, uh, planting to attract pollinators. Um, so I'm going to start out giving you a little bit of overview on how pollinators benefit uh, your garden. Then uh, spend the bulk of the talk talking about things you can do to attract pollinators to your yard and ra end up with um, some resources for learning more. Outside on the tail, there's a handout for folks. Um, so you don't need to frantically write down web links. They're all on this sheet of paper. And at the bottom, um, I'm going to give examples of uh, native plants we have in our garden in front of our headquarters building in Falls Church, Virginia, and mostly use the common names. So I've got the scientific names written out for you, as well as information on the color of the flower and the height. Um, and you'll understand why, hopefully, by the end of the talk. Um, there's also a couple of other handouts I brought on the table, a little bookmark. Um, it has our web link to our pollinator web portal and also um, a tear sheet of the native bumblebees um, in the east. So if you're interested in you know, trying to figure out what type of bees, bumblebees you have in your yard, you can take that home with you. Okay, so as many of you probably know, um, animal pollinators are required to produce many fruits and vegetables. It's estimated about 100 crops and it's a very important to agriculture. I think estimates from 2010, the value of those crops were, is about $30 billion in the U.S. And some plants can self-pollinate, but also are animal pollinated, and they benefit from that animal pollination. Um, it improves the quality. I don't know if you've seen like misshapen fruit, you know, an apple that isn't perfectly cylindrical or a raspberry where half of it looks well formed and the other doesn't. Um, that's typically a result of incomplete pollination and you get less of that when you have animal pollinators than when the plant is self-pollinating. Um, other benefits if you don't have a garden is that 
Um, about 75% of our native plants rely on animal pollinators and that helps them produce the fruits and the seeds and the nuts that attracts wildlife. Um, it also helps those plants reproduce and the plants provide nesting sites for birds and um, hiding sites for all sorts of animals. The pollinators themselves are eaten by small mammals and birds uh, so they're a food source for other wildlife. Um, animal pollination by moving pollen from one plant to another increases genetic diversity in the plant population as a whole and that's important because if environmental conditions change you're going to have um, plants with a variety of characteristics some of which may be more able to tolerate the changed conditions and the population as a whole is more likely to survive than if they all have the same genes. Okay, so we've been talking about pollinators and I want to just talk a little bit about who the pollinators are because they are a wide range of species. Um, in the U.S. there are some birds that are pollinators, primarily hummingbirds. Um, if you're in Hawaii you've got honey creepers that essentially fill the same role. So uh, the top left photo is a hummingbird, the one below it is a honey creeper. Uh, the one next to the honey creeper is a white winged dove. Um, in desert environments especially, um, these are important pollinators for uh, saguaro cacti, and there's a few other birds that are important pollinators. And then in the U.S. we have four species of bats that pollinate. We don't have any of those here in this part of the country. Uh, three of them are out in the desert southwest, and one is restricted to the Florida Keys. And then there's just lots of insects that are pollinators. Um, including bees, and I call those our champion pollinators. They are actually out there collecting not only nectar, but they're also collecting pollen. And they have specialized structures for carrying that pollen. Um, if you look at the picture at the lower left, that's a bumblebee. And if you look very carefully, uh, one of the hind legs is kind of orange. That's where that bee is carrying the pollen. Um, they typically have structures either on their legs or abdomens for carrying pollen. Um, bumblebees are kind of special among the bees in that uh, they're active at lower temperatures and they do this thing called buzz pollination. They move the muscles that control their wings and it makes a buzzing noise. And it also vibrates. And there are certain plants like tomato plants that without that vibration, um, they don't release the pollen. Um, and so bumblebees are the only ones that can do that for them. Um, above the bumblebee is a fly. A lot of the flies that are pollinators look similar to bees and the trick for telling them apart, well there's two tricks. Um, one is the flies only have two wings, one set of wings, whereas bees have four. The other thing is typically um, with flies the eyes take up a much bigger proportion of their head than with bees. So if the head is mostly eyes, it's probably a fly. Um, the two wings is the diagnostic characteristic for it though. Um, they're really important in high elevation and low temperature climates because um, they again are more able to be active when the temperatures are colder. Um, there's some beetles that are pollinators as well um, to the right of the bee is a valley elderberry longhorn beetle. It's a listed species out in California. And we call be beetles um, messy pollinators because a lot of times they will eat part of the flower in the process of doing the pollination. Above that uh, beetle is a moth. That's a sphinged moth or a hummingbird moth. And in action, they do look a lot like mini hummingbirds because they will hover like a hummingbird does, beating their wings really fast. They have a long mouth part called a proboscis that's like a straw that gets into those uh, deep flowers. Um, there are other moths that are also pollinators, including some that are nocturnal. Um, again, important species, especially in desert environments. Um, next to our moth is a blueberry bee. So another bee. Uh, those are important in agriculture, as you might imagine from their name. And then underneath is a butterfly, one of the coleus butterflies. Um, butterflies are what we call incidental pollinators. 
they're there for the nectar, but because they have hairy legs and faces and scales on their wings, they collect a bit of pollen incidentally, and as they're moving from one plant to another, they move that pollen with them. Okay, since some of you may not be all that familiar with insect li life cycles, I threw this slide in here. And I wanted to make the point that insects go through four, well, at least the insects that are pollinators, insects that have a complete um, metamorphosis, have four uh, life stages. An egg, a larva or a caterpillar, a pupa, and a butterfly or an adult. So, and bees have similar uh, life stages as well and flies and the beetles. So the larva is really an eating machine. It's uh, typically feeding on vegetation, leaves, uh, sometimes seeds or flowers and stems. Um, the pupa or chrysalis, um, although it looks like not much is happening, there's a whole lot going on inside. It's converting from that larva with chewing mouth parts to the butterfly you see above with a proboscis like the uh, moth I showed you, which is, is good for sipping nectar, and that's all they feed on typically. So if you want to support the full life cycle of insect pollinators, you need to have food and shelter for all of the phases of their life. Like any animal, um, to attract pollinators, you need to provide them with food, you need to provide them with habitat for nesting and foraging and shelter, and then you want to also reduce things that can threaten them. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. This I'm, I'm not going to read. It's just up here uh, to make the point that the different groups of pollinators um, have different floral preferences. So depending upon the size, the shape, the scent of your flowers, you may be attracting different types of pollinators. And these are not hard and fast rules. They're kind of general principles. And then, um, as you can see, the adults are foraging on nectar, and depending upon the group of pollinators, the juveniles or larvae will be foraging on different things, perhaps. Now, with bees, they, uh, both the adults and uh, the bees will be eating pollen and nectar. So one of the key things to attracting pollinators is to provide food in the form of native plants. So as you know, the flowers provide nectar, and pollen, and a, you can see in that top right photo, that's one of our uh, native bees, and um, its leg is all yellow, and that's all covered with pollen. Native plants also provide stems and leaves that provide food for the juvenile stages of pollinators, um, as well as shelter. In the lower left, you see a swallow tail caterpillar on a leaf that it's been chomping on. There have been studies actually done fairly locally, either Maryland or Delaware, showing in communities that have more native plants, they have greater diversity of birds and insects than communities that have mostly non-native ornamentals. The other thing that's nice about native plants is because they're adapted to this area, they tend to require less water and less fertilizer because they're used to the conditions that are here. So there's a lot of native plants to choose from. Um, and I'm going to go through a few things to think about as you're trying to um, select plants for your yard or garden. Um, I would encourage you to include plants that are used by the larvae of our native butterflies and moths. For example, I have here a common milkweed and below it butterfly weed with a monarch butterfly on it. Um, many insects will nectar on milkweed but milkweed is the only plant that the larvae of the monarch butterfly will eat. Um, next to it is a New England aster, and there are many of our bees will um, nectar on a variety of plants, but there are some of them that we call specialist bees because they typically will forage only within one genus of plant or a couple of genera of plants. Um, so we encourage you to plant for those because they may, otherwise they may not be able to find what they need. Um, so New York Aster, and then next to it is Beard's Tongue or Foxglove, which again is used by some specialist bees in the area. A couple of more examples of butterfly uh, host plants. Um, the left, on the left hand side is a black swallowtail. 
The plant below it is Golden Alexanders. Um, that's used by the young of the swallowtail. That swallowtail will also, uh, their young will also use some crops, well crops, uh, herbs, things like parsley and dill that you might have in your yard. So before you kill that caterpillar on your parsley, take a look at it and decide whether maybe it might be a swallowtail and you might want to let it chomp down some of your parsley. Um, next to it is a silvery checker spot butterfly and those, um, the young, eat a lot of composites like black-eyed Susan. When you go, um, so another thing to keep in mind in choosing plants is if you want a variety of pollinators, you're going to want to choose plants that have flowers in a variety of colors and shapes and scents because different ones will attract different types of pollinators. Um, so again, I've shown this here with the beard's tongue on the left, um, a ox eye sunflower in the middle, and um, bee balm on the right side, complete with a bee on the bottom there. The other thing you want to do is when you're doing your planting, you want to plant in clumps, ideally three feet across or more, but if you don't have that much space, it's fine. And the reason for this is it's energetically more efficient for pollinators to forage if they like one type of plant and they're all together. Think about if you have a shopping list of things you need to buy, and if you can go to one shopping center and get everything, versus having to run around to six different shopping centers around town. So if you scatter your plants, one here and one there, that's what you're doing to your pollinators. So that's why we recommend planting in clumps. And of course, they like sunny open areas uh, where they can bask in the sun because unlike us, they don't generate heat internally. They collect their heat if they're an insect from um, the outside, so they need those sunny spots. You also want to choose plants of different heights to give your garden some structure. Places uh, for pollinators to hide when necessary, uh, places for them like in the pupil stage to get away from predators and things uh, so they can do what they need to do. Um, and plants that are going to bloom sequentially over the entire season. And we have a pretty long season from maybe March to October. And one given species of bee or butterfly may only be out in the adult phase for a couple of weeks. So if it doesn't have plants during that couple of week time, it's going to be critical for that species. And so that's why we say to try to plant for the whole season. Um, so here I have uh, blue phlox. That's an early bloomer. It's only about a foot tall. Um, underneath it to the left is black-eyed Susan again. Uh, that's out during the summer, as many of you probably know. And that gets maybe a foot to three feet tall. Next to it, the purple plant is uh, Joe Pie Weed. That one can get five or six feet tall. Um, it also is a summer bloomer. And finally, on the bottom, uh, Goldenrod. Um, there's a couple of different varieties, so some of them are one to three feet tall, others are three to six feet tall. Um, and those bloom into the fall. And they are also really popular plants with the insects, just like the milkweed. There's like whole communities of insects supported on milkweed and goldenrod. So here's just a couple of photos of a pollinator garden showing uh, plants of different heights, clumping your uh, species together. And as you can see, not all of the plants are in bloom at the same time. So that's sort of what we're talking about, the look you're going for. You also want to provide um, nesting and roosting sites, habitat for them. Um, tall grass and shrubs, uh, butterflies will use them for uh, roosting, small trees, hummingbirds use them for nesting. Bumblebees sometimes um, nest at the base of tall grass that is in clumps, like little blue stem. Um, the host plants for butterfly and moth larvae, which we talked about. Um, so about half of our native bees nest in wood and about half nest in soil. Uh, for those that nest in wood, if you can plant things like dogwood, sumac, uh, raspberry, blackberry that have soft pithy centers, they will um, dig those out and as you can see in the bottom, they basically um, lay an egg, provision it with food, build a wall, lay another egg, provision it with food, build a wall. 
um, and then leave the eggs to mature. And what you can see here is the different stages um, uh, from an almost hatched bee to a pupal bee. Plant stems are a place that pollinators also overwinter in. As I said, about half of our bees uh, nest in soil, but they need kind of bare areas in the soil to be able to dig into it. Um, and it's best if it's sandy or loamy soil that's well drained so that they don't get, you know, if you have a big rainstorm, um, they don't get flooded out and in sunny areas. Down decaying wood used by bees, beetles, and flies for uh, nesting and overwintering. A lot of insects overwinter in leaf litter. And um, if you have these stems and seed heads, you don't want to go through and clean your garden in the fall. You want to leave them till spring. The seed heads more for songbirds, things like um, the goldfinch here. But the stems, because you may have bees nesting in them. And if you clean them up in the fall, you're, you're trashing your bees and you won't have any the next year. You need to leave them till spring when they emerge from their nests. Um, it's not really essential that you provide water, but if you do, it needs to be shallow and moving. Shallow so that you don't drown your insect pollinators, and moving so that you're not growing a crop of mosquitoes. It takes about three days for a mosquito to get through its life cycle, so if you have some standing water, you want to be emptying it about twice a week. And they found that most mosquitoes um, stay within 100 or 200 feet of where they hatched out of. So if you're having a big problem with mosquitoes in your yard, go through and figure out where the standing water is and get rid of it. Um, that'll do wonders to, I did that one year and it made a huge difference. Um, and then some pollinators, um, some of the bees and wasps will use mud to make nests, as this mud bee is doing. Um, you'll see butterflies sometimes sipping water um, say next to a stream, a little bit of water that's splashed there. They're really after the minerals in the soil, not the water. Okay, a couple of quick tips. Um, you, if you haven't used the area before, you might want to test the soil and amend it if needed. Hardware stores sell um, soil test kits or you can call um, an extension service. If you're using mulch, recommend pine fine or cedar. Um, hardwood mulch, um, changes the pH of the soil and can be harmful to some of the plants. You want to keep the mulch shallow uh, because uh, bees, bees cannot dig through deep mulch. Uh, also for your bees, you don't want to use landscaping cloth because they can't dig through it to make nests. Um, and plastic mulch isn't good for them. Um, you want to try to water at night. You'll have less evaporation. And if your garden is sitting like right outside your window, you want to consider treating that window or using shades to break up the open look of the window so that you don't have hummingbirds crashing into it. Um, and I'll give you a resource for things to consider to do that at the end. Okay, I want to talk real briefly about reducing threats. A couple of big threats are invasive plants and um, you want to minimize use of pesticides because pesticides, especially if used improperly, can harm pollinators and the plants that they uh, require. So when it comes to invasive plants, um, after you've done your removal or controlled them down to one little spot, um, you want to fill in with native plants so that they don't have the opportunity to come back because um, otherwise they can grow quite vigorously and creep back in, which is why they're called invasive. Um, the other thing is if you have a patch of invasive plants at one end of your yard and you're working there, before you go to the other end of, your, the, of the yard, check yourself. Make sure you're not transporting seeds or little bits of plant that can then root somewhere else and making your problem worse. So if you've got a small problem with invasives, you can hand pull or dig them out. Uh, bigger problems may require herbicides or something like that. Okay, integrated pest management. How many of you are familiar with IPM? Okay, good. So um, IPM is a, kind of an alternative to um, if you've got a pest problem going out and get, say, spraying every couple of weeks. 
you're really going to consider your whole environment. You're only going to treat the pest problem when you need to, when it reaches some sort of level that you decide is a problem. Then when you're treating, you're going to look at a whole array of options to figure out which one will take care of the pest and do the least harm to people and the rest of the environment. You're going to watch what happens after you treat, and if it doesn't work, make adjustments. And if you use this method, um, it actually will save time and money in the long run over just routine treatments. It also helps um, preserve the value of pesticides by uh, preventing problems with or reducing problems with um, insects or plants developing resistance to those pesticides. So that they'll still be effective next time you need to use them. Okay, so um, pest control alternatives. You can do nothing. You can decide, you know, leaving that caterpillar on that plant is fine. You can do mechanical control, pulling things out, uh, removing with gloves insects by hand off your plant if it's a small infestation. Um, you can implement practices to reduce pest problems, cultural controls, like obtaining weed-free mulch so that you're not bringing problems onto your site. Biocontrol, um, one example of that is doing things to encourage beneficial insects. And these are insects that are going to eat um, your pest species. So things like spiders, lace wings, native praying mantises, uh, native ladybugs. And each situation is going to be a little different. You're going to have to look at what your pest is, know what their enemies are, and figure out how to manipulate conditions to encourage them. In general, you want to promote a diverse habitat, but beyond that, it's really going to be very specific to your particular uh, pest problem when it comes to beneficials. And then pesticides. If you have to use them, understand that they may harm pollinators or the plants they need, especially if they're not used properly. Um, some of them will be labeled that they're harmful to bees and give you some tips on how to minimize that. You want to minimize use around pollinators either using location, using them away from pollinators, or timing when pollinators aren't active in the area. But remember the different life stages of pollinators uh, when you're considering that. Always follow the label. It's actually legally binding. And there may be conditions that say, do not apply when bees are active. And then if you've got an array of pesticide alternatives, choose the one that's least toxic. Also, I recommend the least persistent there's most insecticides, you spray them, and after a couple of weeks, they'll have washed off. There are these insecticides that are systemics that get taken up into the plant, and some of those may stay in the plant up to a year. Um, uh, and so great for your target pest, but maybe not so great if it has harmful effects on some of the other uh, life around. You want to choose the most specific alternative available. Um, so, for example, for gypsy moths, there's a type of bacteria that's specific to Lepidoptera that can be used to control those. There's also a similar type of uh, bacteria to control mosquitoes. It'll affect other diptera, but not butterflies, not bees. Um, and then avoid dust, and that's just because um, they tend to blow around. And that's another thing, you don't want to treat when it's really windy, because you're not going to get your target, it's going to get all over the place, in addition to your target. Okay, so I'm quickly going to walk through uh, these resources. So the ones listed here, gardening and conservation, the first one is the Fish and Wildlife Service Pollinator Portal. Uh, we have a page having to do with gardening. Um, the Forest Service also has a gardening page, that's the next one. Uh, pollinator.org has a learning center. Gardening is one of probably 15 topics that they have on their web page. Um, Xerxes has a pollinator conservation web page. And finally, the DC government. Um, their pollinator web page tells you a little bit about gardening. Um, it tells you what native plants are that are good for pollinators. Um, you can even look up uh, nearby nurseries. Now, not endorsing any of the nurseries that are on there, totally independent of Fish and Wildlife Service, but it is a place that you can go to look for that information. 
You want to learn more about native plants? The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, wildflower.org, has this uh, great database and you can enter a plant name and it'll pull up information on colors, what light or water conditions it likes, the size, all sorts of information. You can also generate information from a pick list of your local conditions, you know, where you're located, what soil type you have, and that sort of thing. Um, Plant Native has something similar as well, but there was a note on the website that made me think it may not be very current. Both of these websites also have ways to find local uh, wildflower societies or native plant societies. They often have sales in the spring of local native plants and they have a, another nursery finder on those sites as well. Um, native plant guides for our area we've got a great one um, for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, it has little photos of the plants, tells you the conditions they like, tells you what they'll attract, um, and you can just uh, go to our website and either view it or download it. Virginia, um, has, the state of Virginia has a website on native plants as well. And uh, similar to some of the other ones, you can kind of pick your conditions and it'll generate a list for you. And then pollinator.org has what they call ecoregion guides. You plug in your zip code and it pulls up a guide for your specific ecoregion. It has lists of native plants and again it tells you what they like in terms of light and so on. Um, if you want to know who these specialist bees are that I was talking about and the plants they like, that website on the bottom is for you. Um, the Forest Service has this nifty little brochure, uh, well a nifty web page um, on pollinator biology where you can learn more about all the different types of pollinators. Um, also a guide that Fish and Wildlife put together for Air Force recently has a, chat, a section 2A um, and that talks about uh, pollinator life cycles, pollinator habitat requirements. Okay, so Forest Service has this nifty brochure called Bee Basics and it really covers uh, the breadth of our native bees and you can download that free. Um, the Xerxes website also has a lot of information on native bees. Finally, there's a Butterfly and Moths website where you can either go in and choose your, uh, down to your county and get a checklist of what you might expect to find or you can put in a species and it'll tell you what did the adults feed on, what do the larvae feed on, what does it look like, how do you distinguish it from other uh, butterflies or moths. Um, you want to learn more about integrated pest management, we have a fact sheet for that. And as I said, I was going to give you a resource about treating your windows to prevent bird strikes. Okay, so those are all on the handout that's outside. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks so much.